The Browns, fresh off the bye, try to keep their playoff hopes alive in Miami. We'll talk to Mike Oliva of Dolphins Talk and get you the latest fantasy football news with Jake Seeley of The Athletic. My sick picks, too. All coming up on the sick podcast with Andy McNamara. Turn up your volume. Your volume. Because you're about to listen to The Sick Podcast with Andy McNamara, the sickest Cleveland Browns podcast. Cut back by Chubb. He's to the 10. He's still running to the 5. He dips outside left. He's going in. Touchdown. What a run. Nick Chubb. It's going to be sick. Hey, everybody. Okay, Andy McNamara with you. Let's go, Browns fans. First, I want to know. Your Browns predictions. Okay, I want to know. Are they winning? Are they are they pulling this out? Is it like Jake Trotter from ESPN told us on Tuesday show that the Browns win? He believes they will make the playoffs. I do. I, I love this because as a Browns fan, I'm sure all of you watching and, and listening are the same way. You know, you get nervous. It's, oh, they're terrible. They can't do it. And then by the time as the game approaches, you buy in. And really, you think, why not? Right? So Dolphins, Michael Liv is going to join me in a few minutes. First, though, I want to get to my three downs, the three downs to victory for the Cleveland Browns. Number one, I've been saying it all season. Pundits have been saying it all season. In and out of the team. You fans have been saying it all season. Kevin Stefanski, run the damn ball. Run it. I don't care if they stop at the first three series. Keep running it. You have Nick Chubb. You have Kareem Hunt. David Njoku is going to be a game-time decision. Run the ball. You know what happens when you run the ball? You get a game, a victory like you did in Carolina. And even more so, more recently, and a better outcome, was the Bengals game before the bye that Thursday night. You ran the ball a lot. A lot. Now, the Dolphins' defense, run defense, around 15th in the league. So good, but not great. And you're going to have your chances to throw the ball. I'm not saying you run it 60 times. We're not talking before the forward pass here in the NFL. But run the ball. Use what works. And I'm not confident that Stefanski is going to do that because it seems whenever it does work, he can't help himself but to get away. And what worries me is that in this type of game with Mike McDaniels of the Dolphins, who's a similarly minded offensive thinker who makes some questionable in-game decisions as well, that he's going to start getting into a throwing match. If you get into a throwing match with the Miami Dolphins, it's not going to go well for you. That's not going to go well for you because you have Tyreek Hill – and Jalen Waddle, both receivers in the top five in the NFL. Tyree kills on pace to 2,000 receiving yards. He's number one. Waddle is five. You're not going to win that battle. So don't play that game. If you, As in Mad Men, as Don Draper said, if you don't like the answer, change the conversation. Make it come to you. So Kevin Stefanski, run the damn ball. My second down, take the points. Okay, this is, again, a season-long message. I know your Stefanski, your, your analytics card, your big thing, the guy up in the sky telling you what the percentages say. We'll say go for it. And this, In this game versus this team on the road, and by the way, the Dolphins have won nine of their last ten at Hard Rock Stadium. Don't get cute. Field goal range, take the points. You know who takes the points? Bill Belichick. Belichick takes the points. Season coaches take the points, especially – on the road. So if it's fourth and three and you're at the 10, let your rookie kicker K door get you the three points. Keep pace. You cannot let this Miami Dolphins team run up the score on you. Take the points when you have the chance. Again, don't get analytics overly focused. Take the points. Is he going to do it? Is that going to happen? Again, my confidence level is not high on that because we have not seen him do this. We have not seen the Browns play calling go that route. Hopefully that Cincinnati game and self-scouting through the bye has been able to say, okay, you know what? We have to play to our strengths more. Make sure you follow on Twitter at SickPodBrowns and at AndyMC81. Get your Browns fantasy football betting questions in using hashtag AskAndy. Click like wherever you're watching and leave a comment positive, please, in the comment section. Share, tell your friends and all that. My third down key to victory for the Browns, keep the Dolphins under 30 points. Okay, and here's why. The Dolphins have won three games by 30 or more points, including their last two. They've also lost three games by 30 or more points. That pass defense can be had. The run defense, I know it's in the middle, but I think the reason it's jacked up a little bit is because um, they've gotten up to such big leads, team half, teams have to play catch-up. So you keep them under 30 points by... The first two options, running the ball, 
controlling the game clock. Keep it out of Tua's hands as long as possible. Under 30 points, I think the Browns win this game. We'll get to my fantasy football hashtag Ask Andy and sick picks for NFL Week 10. My betting picks. Also, Jake Seeley from The Athletic with some fantasy football talk. Get you ready for Week 10. That's coming up. But right now, on the line, Michael Liva from Dolphins Talk to give us a Miami perspective. This Dolphins team is rolling. Mike, thank you for joining me. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? We're doing good, man. Listen, I'll be honest. I'm nervous about this game for the Browns. I'm very <laughs> nervous. I, I'm. I, it's on the road. You guys have won, what, nine of your last ten at home? And Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell, as soon as the ball touches their hands, they are doing pretty much whatever they want. What's the feel in Miami with how this team has performed ever since really two has come back from that uh, horrible concussion? Yeah, aside from the games he hasn't, you know, missed, the offense has been red hot. And if you're going to beat Miami, you better be ready to put up some points because – they're going to get theirs one way or another, so you better outscore them uh, one way or another. Um, the offense is clicking on all cylinders. There's open wide receivers. Then there's Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle open where they with their speed, and they're so dangerous. They can they create so much separation that they're just you know wide open for anybody to throw the ball to. Yeah. They are that good. And when they get the ball in their hands, they make plays, they score touchdowns. And here's the thing too about this offense. You know, I if you haven't watched Miami play much this year, I think a lot of fans are well, they're show they're out there and they're throwing short uh short passes and those guys are just running after the like a little five yard catch. No. They are like last and like last or almost last in yak yards after catch. Yeah. These are throwing it down the field, nine, 10 yard passes, throwing it deep down the field. They're getting their yards in the air and it's an attack offense that can score anywhere on the field, short drives, three, four plays, five plays, few minutes, and they're in the end zone. Um, offense has been unbelievable. Well, Mike, what really stands out to me as well as to his efficiency and the offense as a whole on third down, right? To be able to continue drives. And like you said, this isn't – no, they, they can always lean if they need to on a dink and dunk, but this is not a dink and dunk team. This isn't a Jimmy G throw it to Christian McCaffrey one yard out and go. Like you said, they can stretch. They can be creative, and that's what you have with those type of weapons. Um, when it comes to the offensive line, because the Browns have, of course, Miles Garrett, Jadavian Clowney, both as healthy as you're going to be at this time of year coming out of the bye. Uh, how is that offensive line holding up? Because like we said, Tua did get get crunched quite a bit this year early. Um is there is it operating fine? Is is Clowney and uh, Garrett a worry for this team? Uh, he was crunched early though because he held onto the ball too long. Not necessarily because the offensive line. When Teron Armstead is on the field and he's healthy, the offensive line is fine. It's absolutely fine. If Armstead's off the field and he missed most of one game and stuff, I mean he's been on the field most of the year. But when he's on the field, the offensive line is absolutely fine. It's when he's not. It's kind of like a house of cards that crumbles. And he will play this week. He's fine. So when he's on the field, the offensive line has uh, been very good. They lost their left guard, Liam Eichenberg, to an injury. He's probably out for the season. He was probably the weak spot on the offensive line. So never want to see anybody get hurt, not saying that. But I, I think in the eyes of many, it was sort of addition by subtraction by hmm. putting in someone else there that they probably even upgraded that spot a little. And at right tackle, Austin Jackson has only played one game this year, which was week one. He's back and healthy. I don't know if he's going to play this week, but – the, he might not even have his job back because uh, Brandon Shell has sort of stepped in and been very good at right tackle. So the offensive line, probably middle of the pack if you look around the league, but it's not going to hurt them by any means. Now, what about the running game? Because the addition of Jeff Wilson, you sort of have that 49ers component, the band back together a little bit with Mostert and McDaniels and all that. Is if if the Browns and I'm not going to say stop Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle because that's near impossible. Contained to a certain degree, Denzel Ward is back. First game off a concussion after missing three, so that's huge. New some linebackers and all that. Taki Taki is going to be in there for JOK. Uh, can the running game be counted on? Do you expect that to become more a part of the offense with Jeff Wilson being added in? Yeah, I think it's going to improve some. Here's the thing: Chase Edmonds weeks one, two, and three actually played very well. Then week four against Cincinnati in the first quarter, he dropped a touchdown in the end zone. And 
ever since then, he like fell off a cliff. He lost all his confidence, and he just wasn't the same player, literally from one play, which is kind of amazing. Wow. Um, Raheem Mostert, he's the number one back, and he's been doing very, very good this year. Last week, once they added Wilson, that was his first game last week for Miami, he actually led the team in rushing yards. He scored a receiving touchdown. Mostert had a rushing touchdown. I think now with Wilson, you're going to see more of a 50-50 split. Both those guys, they average about four and a half, five yards a carry. They're both very good. Wilson's got a little bit more pop. I can see a little bit more speed when he hits the hole. Um, but Mostert, for most of this year, um, has been – Absolutely great. Can't complain. Is he one of the top guys in the league? No, but he fits this offense perfectly in that he he knows the scheme, as does Wilson, because they both spend time with Mike McDaniel in San Francisco. They know what's expected, and it's a nice little one-two punch I think they got now because what we saw last week from Wilson is he was able to step in, fit like a glove. He knows the offense. He knows the coaching staff. And he, so he, he came in, and he was able to contribute. And that little running game right there, I think – is going to be more than enough when you complement that with the passing game they have, which is so explosive. You just have to keep the, the defense honest. It has to be good enough, right? To, good enough, to, that's it. To account for it. And it looks like, like you said, that that is going to be good enough. So, Mike, if you're a Browns fan watching this, the Browns can beat the Dolphins if – what's your key to victory for the, the visitors? Keep the offense on the sideline. I'd run Chubb early, often, and yep. run him again. Same thing with Hunt. Get him in there. Just keep – because if you let Miami's offense on the field, you might stop him on the drive here or there. You might hold him to a field goal here or there. The more they're on the field, they're eventually – they're going to they're gonna get their points. Yeah. I wouldn't even – I mean, I don't even know how any team can stop Hill and Waddle because I'm sure teams have tried everything, zone, this, that. I mean, the, I'm sure every team's tried everything so far. So I would, I would just sort of write that off that they're going to get theirs. It's just limit the opportunities that they're on the field to do it. And then – I would also you know, um, rush the quarterback and try to get after the quarterback to make his life not let him get the ball to those guys as easily. So I think run the ball and try to get after the quarterback because, honestly, if it becomes a shootout, I think the Browns yeah. are in trouble like most teams are. Yeah, you don't want the ball in Jacoby Brissett's hand late in the game to come back because, Mike, we've seen that on multiple occasions this year where the moments – and I don't blame Jacoby Brissett – that's not his his job. You know, he's a fine backup, but the ball in his hands, he turns the ball over, it's intercepted, and the play calling's questionable. So I don't blame Brissett. I think for the Browns, too, it has to be not all-out blitzes. It has to be that front four pressure. Because if you send the house, we know Tua just sit there and boop, then you got a dink and dunk to Tyreek or Jalen, and then you're gone. Yeah, and uh, yeah, absolutely. They have to get pressure with four. And also... Jacoby Brissett, we know him all too well in Miami. He was here yeah, last you do. year. Yeah, of course. Different, different offense. Whole di- I mean, night and day. It's not even close. Um, he had his, he wasn't that great, but again, he didn't have everything to work with that he would have had if he was here say this year. Uh, I think Jacoby's okay. I know some fans, if you look at it just last year, no quarterback would have been successful last year in Miami. No. The Head coach didn't care about offense. He didn't have a staff that cared about offense. He had about five guys. He didn't know each play who was going to send in the play. It was a disaster, and they had no weapons. So I think Jacoby might be a little motivator for this game. So I think that's something else for the Browns. I think he's going to want to go out there and uh, show um, show the Miami fans and show the Miami organization who he really is. And I think it's going to be a closer game, but um, I just think it's so much offense for Miami. If they're clicking – it's just so tough to keep up with them. Now they don't always click, but of late they've been clicking the past eight quarters, nine quarters. Well, and they've been clicking whenever two is in there undefeated six and oh, right. Yep. So yeah, you know, nine, nine, 10 at hard rock. And I think to me, Mike, it's, if the Browns can keep this under 30 points, that's their best chance. If you're over 30, it, it's going to get away from you. If you can run it, like you said, control the clock, keep those long drives on offense and keep it under 30 points. That's the best chance. Absolutely. I mean, that is the chance. Chubb, I think, is probably the most important player in this game because if he has a day, that means Miami's offense will be staying on the sideline. Um, The other factor here, which we're still at that part of the year, the heat. We've seen teams come down to Miami, and you think you can prepare for it. it, You will melt in this heat. (laughs) We saw the Bills week three melt in the heat. The Patriots week one showed up one week early. They melt. It didn't matter. It's not enough time. Melted. Minnesota, even though they won the game, 
they melted by the end of the game. They could hardly stand, and it's gonna be hot. It's gonna be humid, and the way they have the facility built, the sun beats right down on the opponents, oh, and the Dolphins brilliant. are sitting in the shade. So you're gonna see it because they're gonna talk about it because every TV broadcast shows it. it when you got one o'clock games, especially September, October, even now we're still early November, it's still uh, somewhat of a factor. The sun it just beats down on the square on the field, which is the opponents. And you got the Dolph. The sun is a fa- at the heat because it's supposed to be like 85, but the humidity. And if it rains a little bit, which they're having a lot of storms down there, that is a factor that a lot of teams or a lot of fans even don't take into account. Because I've seen so many teams just melt. Now, if Miami stunk, it wouldn't matter. But yeah, yeah, yeah. but when they're good, it becomes <laughs> the X factor in this because teams just can't stay hydrated enough. Phenomenal engineering by the stadium builder. Yes. Oh, it was planned. Yeah, absolutely. Planned totally that way. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, lots of Gatorade. And like you said, that's gonna that's gonna be a factor in running the ball. So um, especially to if you trail late, that heat gets you, I'm sure, even more just psychologically, right? So boy, that's gonna be gonna be fascinating. Look, Mike, tell everybody where they can find your work. Uh, you know, Dolphins fans and, and just really some uh, after checking out the site, just great NFL content. Yeah, absolutely. Um Everybody can head to the website, dolphinstalk.com. We have a podcast each and every day in season. We have articles, videos. We have all that stuff up. And if you're on Twitter, if you're still on Twitter, uh, you can follow me (laughs) at Dolphins Talk on Twitter and also on Instagram, just in case something ever happens to Twitter. I have a backup (laughs) Instagram. God, yeah, who knows? Hopefully the show's up on Twitter. Otherwise, yeah, Instagram for sure. All right, Mike. thank, Thank you so much for the insight. Appreciate it. No problem. Anytime. Thank you. All right. There he is, Michael Oliva from Dolphins Talk. Yeah, the whole Twitter thing. Elon Musk. Whew. I mean, uh, we love Elon. No, 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 no problem. Elon, no problem. No problem. We're, we're all good. We love you. Sure. Yeah, that's that's going to be interesting. I, and what Mike said, that heat is certainly a factor. Absolutely. But it's going to come down to, are you trailing late? Are you getting blown out? That heat feels a whole lot worse then. Like you said, you can't prepare, but it can be a factor, but you can still win. Like you said, the Vikings won, but they're undefeated with Tua. The point, my three downs, the one that, I, and everything ties into how you get to this point. Under 30 points, Browns, Browns win this ballgame. They win this ballgame. Now, if they lose, you got your next, these next three games decide the season, folks. Okay, you're three and five right now. You win, you're four and five. Let's go. You lose, certainly a blow, but not undeniable that you can't come back from it. You got the Buffalo Bills, Josh Allen. How is that elbow going to look? That's a big question. Boy, the Bills will still still look a whole lot different if you got Case Keenum, who the Browns know well, was here last year, under center rather than Josh Allen, right? So how does that track? And then you got the Buccaneers. And now Tom Brady led a comeback, I'll use quotations, against the Rams. Settle down. Okay, let's let's chill. The Rams suck. Matthew Stafford's a disaster. That whole situation, what a color, what a Super Bowl hangover. So, you know, let's see how they do in Germany against the Seahawks. All right. And then and then we'll see. So that that would be that third game. That's a winnable game. So if the Browns, Browns got to win two out of their next three. Gotta win two out of their next three. They do that. You need to get to the point where you don't have any more than six losses when Deshaun Watson comes back December 4 against the Houston Texans. If you're in that spot, the playoffs are still very much in reach. Very much in reach. Now, you lose two or three, then, you know, pretty much ball game. But great talking with Mike on the Dolphins. Still to come, fantasy football talk with Jake Seeley from The Athletic. And right now, you know what? Let's get to hashtag ask Andy and hear some of your questions and get those answered right now. All right, there we go. So we'll get to a couple here. If I don't answer them, I will on Twitter. Uh, and then, yeah, like Mike said, maybe uh, just be eh, on Instagram too, at Andy MC Sports, at the Sick uh, Pod Browns on Instagram and on Twitter as well, at Sick Pod Browns and at Andy MC81. All right, this one coming from Rob on Twitter, Rob Rayner. Uh, let's see. Okay, he said, great show. Thank you, Rob. Um, a question for you, Garoppolo or Carr for week 10? 
Jimmy Garoppolo or David Carr for week 10? Or Derek Carr. <laughs> Certainly don't. Well, although Derek is playing like his older brother right now. Um, I'm going to say you definitely go with Jimmy Garoppolo. And the reason being is this. Quietly, Jimmy G. And if you watch Tuesday's show, you saw this is one of my under the wire, waiver wire pickups. Jimmy Garoppolo, very quietly last month, he's averaged 18 fantasy points. Okay, 11 to 4 touchdown to interception ratio over seven games. Knows the offense. You got Christian McCaffrey. Unlike Tua for the Dolphins, who's not thinking and Duncan. Jimmy G, that's his bread and butter, baby. And you got CMC. You have all the pieces around to be able to get that done. Jimmy Garoppolo, no doubt about it. Now, the Raiders have been impacted huge by injuries. Darren Waller on IR. Hunter Renfro, who wasn't doing anything anyway, he's on IR. So Waller, who you... If you had him as your fantasy tight end, I do in one of my leagues. You, you've made preparations already because he's been out for so long. So long. Uh, Renfro's on the waiver wire. Mac Hollins. Mac Hollins is somebody, if you're in bye week trouble, some heavy hitters missing this week. If you're in bye week trouble and you need a streamer, nice DFS play as well, going to be cheap. Mac Hollins has popped this year when given the opportunity. Now, Devontae Adams should, and rightfully so, get most of the targets. And most of those chances, but if you don't go his way, really all that's left is Josh Jacobs and now Matt Collins. So Matt Collins is a great pickup there uh, as well. So that's a little bonus bit. So uh, answer the question, go Garoppolo over Carr. Uh, from at Mahomes underscore zone underscore 15. Andy, is Josh Allen going to play? Hashtag ask Andy. That's a big question. The latest is that coach Sean McDermott of the Buffalo Bills has said Josh Allen is not day by day. Not day to day, hour by hour, hour by hour. That means this is a true game time decision, which makes a huge fantasy impact. If you go from Josh Allen to Case Keenum, I don't have to tell you that obviously downgrades Stefan Diggs, Gabe Davis. It, it, it's a huge impact. And the other side, if Josh Allen does play, is he going to finish the game? And if he stays in the game, is his arm going to be as accurate? We saw some floaters, right? We did. So how is that going to affect it? How is that going to impact things? So you better have a backup. That's where Jimmy G, if Justin Fields is sitting somewhere on a waiver wire on your league, I doubt he is now, but get him. Um, Trevor Lawrence, I like as well. Trevor Lawrence as a, a, a quarterback pickup. I like Trevor Lawrence because it's going to be a four shootout with Kansas City, I feel. So those are some, some options there. All right, if I didn't get to your question, hashtag Ask Andy on Twitter at AndyMC81 at SickPodBrowns. Now, it's week 10, okay? I've been, been looking at the lines. I've been looking at the odds. And I got some sick picks for you, baby. Let's do it. Sick picks. It's time for sick picks. All right, sick picks. You saw, hey, I got a cold. Wipe my nose. <laughs> sick picks time, baby. Okay, let's win you some money this week. Here's something. Okay, so one I mentioned earlier in the week, and the uh, odds have actually stayed the same. I'm a little surprised about this, uh, that the odds haven't dipped a little bit. Actually, they've gone more in Seattle's favor, plus 125 on Tuesday. They're plus 120. That Seahawks-Buccaneers game in Germany. Remember, 9.30 a.m. start. So fantasy football-wise, make sure you're setting your fantasy lineups early. But that two and a half points, I'm double dipping on the Seahawks. Like I said, two and a half point. Underdogs, love it. Plus 125 to straight up win. Seahawks 3-2 and two on the road. Different type of road here, of course. But that makes a ton of sense to me. Also, prop play-wise. Now, I haven't been able to find in any of the sports book a team total rushing attempts. If you can find that, whatever the number is, take the over for the Colts game with Jeff Saturday. Good Lord, Jim Ursay is an absolute madman. That goes with the, the Raiders game too. So I think Derek Carr could have a good game to go back to the uh, fantasy question. But uh, the, the, the Colts, this is a this is a uh, complete train wreck. This is as close to a tank job as you can get. Are they going to get, are the Colts going to get lucky again? You got Peyton Manning by bombing. Andrew Luck by bombing. You going to get another guy? It's supposed to be a good quarterback here. But whatever the rushing attempts, the team total, take the over. Anytime touchdown for Jonathan Taylor, smash it. He's healthy. Jeff Saturday's an offensive lineman. What do offensive linemen love to do? Run the ball. 
Also, when you have Sam Ellinger at quarterback, who's not good, run the ball. Offensive line bad, doesn't matter. Run the ball. Anytime touchdown for Jonathan Taylor, smash. Absolutely smash that play for sure. And then we look at the Cowboys four and a half point favorites over the Packers. Uh, minus 110 payout for uh, the Cowboys. Not the biggest payout, but that's a safe one. If you need a safe, safe one, go up against the Packers. The Packers are done. Okay, you're three and six. You lost to the Lions. You lost to the Lions. I picked the Lions to win last week, by the way. Lost to the Lions, did Aaron Rodgers. You're beating a healthy Dak Prescott and Dalton Schultz. Dalton Schultz back as well. Uh, I would take Dalton Schultz for an anytime touchdown as well. And the uh, receptions for him is set at three and a half. I would take the over on that for another prop play in game. I'm taking the, uh, the Cowboys four and a half point favorites for sure. Over under set at 44. Now the Browns Dolphins game. I was looking the over under is set at 49. And that total is okay. As long as the Browns are in the twenties with it, because that goes back to my three downs of Cleveland, keeping it under 30 points. I would say take the over, and I hope it's not a big over, and I hope that the majority of the points are in favor of the Browns, of course, but take the over on the 49. We've seen the Browns been able to score quite a bit, 24 or more points, uh, averaging out with the offense, and like we said, Tua is putting up with that offense, leading the way 30-plus points three times this year and in back-to-back games. So I would take the over for that Browns-Dolphins game. All right, that's it for Sick Picks. Coming up next. More fantasy football talk. We deep dive into NFL Week 10. All the tips you need with my guy, Jake Seeley from The Athletic. Make sure you're hitting us up on social media at the Sick Pod Browns. Give us a follow. YouTube page, give us a like, give us a follow. Turn the notifications on to get me on Twitter as well at AndyMC81, Instagram at AndyMCSports. All right, everybody, let's take a look at Week 10 Fantasy football around the National Football League. We have some more teams on buys. It's also the halfway point of the season. And naturally, some injury news coming out. Jake Seeley, my guy from The Athletic, joins me right now. Jake, how are you, buddy? I'm doing good. It's been too long. I know. It's been way too long. But thank you so much for jumping on. Uh, always appreciate that. Love the backdrop. Looking good. All the, where all the pop goes? What are those? The... The Funkos? Yeah, the Funkos. too many of them. Like, there's Funkos on top of Funkos. And, but you there's, like You can't even... Oh, you got one back there? Got, you actually have on, one? Hold on, I got... And guess what? It's a Baker one, <laughs> Jake! It's a Baker one! No! The, the worst one possible? Actually, I have an old Odell Beckham with the Giants back here somewhere, oh, but yeah. that was back... Yeah, that was back before he blocked me on Twitter, so... That was, <laughs> that was a long time ago. Hey, Johnny Manziel blocked me, so we're, uh, you know, it's all good. <laughs> I, that one's not, not as surprising as Odell Beckham. No, no, yeah, that's true. That's true. Johnny's a bit more of a loose cannon. Uh, I don't think this one will age well. I don't think that'll have no. to hold some value, but, uh, you know, it looks kind of cool. But anyway, uh, you know what? Let's let's start with this Browns-Dolphins matchup in any head-to-head. And I think really when we look at these two teams, there's not, when it comes to fantasy football, any um, necessary surprises. You know, you're playing your Nick Chubb. You're playing your Tyreek Hill. Does anybody jump out to you as like uh, somebody to play or not play outside of the usual suspects? I mean, I think on the Brown side, you get Donovan Peoples Jones in your lineups. If you're looking for somewhat kind of like a Gabriel Davis play where boom or bust, you could potentially get a top 20 finish. He's been better on the road. Actually, his numbers, they've played, as you know, three road games versus more at home. The numbers are almost identical for road and home, but that's because and then he's played fewer games on the road, so it's actually better. Uh, the interesting thing about Mari Cooper is, for whatever reason, as you well know, he only catches touchdowns at home, but the good <laughs> news here is the Browns are actually set up passing-wise very good because the Dolphins run a ton of man coverage, and that's where Cooper does so much of his damages against man coverage. So, yeah, Cooper's in there, Nick Chubb's in there. I think Kareem Hunt, if you're looking for running back help, obviously – we know all the Dolphins, but I think Donovan Peoples-Jones is the one that you could get in there. If it is Ninjoku, you play Ninjoku. But if not, I've always been a Harrison Bryant fan. Hey, possession, PPR, as far as a chain mover, he has been able to do that. I think the one question that really jumps out to me when it comes to the Dolphins, and I don't like the running back situation as a whole there, but Moster, Wilson, is it like, or do we avoid both? Can we play one or the other? Where are you at with, with Moster and the Wilson situation? I think we play both. Uh, yeah, there's been a lot of backfields this year because, you know, the NFL is a copycat league and there's been a lot of it like, well, is it this year's Broncos? Is it this year's Broncos and blah, blah. 
I think this is finally we do have this year's Broncos because the biggest thing about last year's Broncos is you could start Javante Williams and Melvin Gordon every single week. Yep. It wasn't like, ooh, it might be one, but not the – it's most every single week there were both top 25 running backs and one of them would finish as an RB1. I think that's what we're now looking at with Jeff Wilson and Mostert. I think Wilson stepped in front of him, and I would say the share probably even leans to him a little bit more because how, you know this. How, how long have we been covering the NFL to see the NFL – to see a running back traded to a new team and immediately get the lead – work that first week on a short week so i'd say maybe the split gets a little bit more 60 40 for wilson but the offense is too good and they like moster's explosiveness too but they like fast players as you know that's what they built around tua so i would think you can get both of them probably in your lineup i trust call me crazy but with deandre swift how banged up he still is i would start mostert over swift until we see swift 100 percent. that's how much i trust this backfield yeah, it is, um, you know, that 49ers sort of feel, right? You're bringing it, getting the band back together type of deal. <laughs> for for Tua, 6-0 and when he's in the lineup are the Dolphins. And boy, and hopefully he can still stay healthy. But this guy's looking like a true QB1 fantasy-wise and real-life-wise. Yeah, the biggest thing is they're building similar to the Eagles with Hurts. And what is starting to happen with the Bears is they're starting to build teams around the ability instead of trying to force the issue. You know, Tua came in and there was the problems with Devonta Parker and then Preston Williams, who didn't really fit him. The biggest thing, if you look at Tua's skill set, is he throws guys open. He did it in college. He does it in the NFL. He throws them open, and he wants the guys who get open quick. And that's why they traded for Tyreek Hill and drafted Jalen Waddell. And that's what's really been able to take Tua to the next level. So I don't think there's anything stopping him. I know everybody's super excited for Justin Fields in fantasy because he's running. I'd still take Tua. I would take Tua over Dak. I'd take Tua, honestly, at this point, over Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers with how miserable they've been. Tua, in my opinion, is pushing to be a top five, six quarterback back in the in fantasy leagues now in conversation with jake seeley from the athletic on twitter at all in kid jake let's uh, let's keep with that conversation there because we're at the halfway point of the season and it's bizarre it's bizarre especially at quarterback tom brady and aaron Rodgers stink fantasy wise yeah. aaron Rodgers is imploding he's going to be hosting jeopardy next year i'm sure <laughs> I, and we have geno smith the king like jake he has for starters the best completion percentage in the nfl I can't believe we're saying that. It seems absurd to even have thought us saying anything other than, oh, Drew Locke's coming in for Geno Smith in a fantasy football (laughs) season. But here, it's such a strange year at the halfway point, isn't it? It's really strange. Also, you look at the fact that Matthew Stafford is one of the worst quarterbacks in the league right now. And that was the Rams were supposed to be a favorite to go back to the Super Bowl. And that team's been entire. You want to talk about disappointment. Cam Akers, Allen Robinson, just go to the entire Rams team outside of Cooper Cup has been a disappointment, mostly because of that offensive line. But the Geno one, I think, is the biggest shocker of all of them, because Russell Wilson, that big move going to Denver and Denver stinks and Russell Wilson stinks and everything stinks over there. There's people that want to drop Cortland Sutton in fantasy because of how bad things have been. And this was supposed to be Russell Wilson fixing everything. And they gave him that mega contract for the next couple of years. And I don't know if they're happy about that now. Because you mentioned Geno's playing better ball. I think the biggest thing you look at that is Geno's playing what Russell Wilson used to play with that team. Not quite the passing numbers that Russ has, but it's that mobility. Russell Wilson's lost it. He wasn't running as much. And now as it drops down further and further, uh, you kind of look at, granted, it was disgusting for the Colts last week. But one of the reasons they went to Ellinger is because when you have broken offensive lines, Daniel Jones with the Giants, you want somebody who can extend the plays. And Russell Wilson, at this point of his career, just can't do it anymore. And I think what you're seeing with Geno is that that little extra extending of plays is helping him to hit DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett when he needs to. And the fact that the last number of years, Russell Wilson has never really had a true, healthy, consistent running back. And Kenneth Walker, That's true. you know, break the glass, Stone Cold Steve Austin <laughs> music, Jake. He's coming in and he's taking over. It's, it's phenomenal. So that's also helping things. It's definitely helping things. I, I will say this uh, and call me crazy and we'll see at the end of the year, but i am he's one of my favorite sell high candidates. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't love the Seahawks schedule. And plus, I don't love, I think Ken Walker is being kind of overshadowed on his struggles because he's still breaking big plays. It's part of his game. Like, yeah. you know, when, when we nitpick players, it's not to say like I'm taking away Ken Walker's ability to bust off a big play in 40 yards, 50 yards in any play and break a tackle. But he still has one of the highest stuff rates in the NFL is the fact that, like, so for everybody out there, if he doesn't get past the line of scrimmage, you would think that if you look at his rate, he was playing on a team like the Rams. But he's playing on the Seattle's team who has a pretty good offensive line. It's middle of the road, and he's still getting stuffed a lot. And I'm not saying that's going to stop him. 
But at some point, usually that catches up. I'm not calling him Trent Richardson, but oh. it's that same little, you know, you get bottled up the offensive line, and if you don't get through it and break that big play, you'll have a stunted week, and then they're bringing in Travis Homer to be mixed in a little bit more. Again, I don't think, like, I'm not saying he's not a top 20, even top 15 running back, for, but for the world, as you just said, there's the perception out there that, oh, my God, he's the new top five running back, and that's why he's so high. That's why. Yeah, it's well, that's, that's a good point. You know, you try to collect some assets depending on what type of league you're in. Some yeah. other mid-season surprises, positive or negative for you, Jake. I, I was doing a, a deep dive the other day and just looking at some of the, the preseason rankings compared to what's happened. There's some shockers outside of quarterback. Anybody jump out to you as far as like, wow, I really thought this guy was going to pop compared to, you know, somebody who maybe just came out of nowhere like a Geno Smith or whoever else? Well, I, I mentioned Cam Akers, so that really yeah. hurt. <laughs> that, I was high on Cam Akers this year. Uh, Me I too, will man. Say, uh, the, the, the bigger one uh, at running back is I was a Damian Pierce fan. I was somebody who didn't fall into the, oh, well, Florida only gave him so many touches, so why is the NFL going to do anything differently? Like, yeah. Sometimes you have to see these roles in college. I think even my expectations for him, this is he's far su- su- surpassing them. Uh, to see him in this bell cow role and having – what top 12 RB one numbers for the Houston Texans. I think that's a huge surprise to me. And then mostly because of injuries. But if you looked at the wide receiver draft class and I had Drake London in tier one, I thought Mm. if you told me I had to pick my favorite, it would have been London, but to see London so much worse than Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson because of where he landed on that team, which the Falcons are surprised by themselves. The fact that they're winning this many yeah. games by running, whether they're up, down, or in between, I think are surprising in and of their own rights. But the way that Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson are hitting and Drake London isn't, it's just, it's kind of painful, but it's also, I'm impressed with how good Olave's looked already for the Saints. Yeah, Olave's been phenomenal with quarterback questions of his own. Let's stick with yeah. the Falcons. Disappointment from Drake London. How about disappointment from Kyle Pitts? From Kyle Pitts. <laughs> That's it, this. It's the offense. I mean, yeah, you can have it all is. the air. Like you know the metrics. Everybody loves air yards and air yards per target and team target share. And you know I all use these numbers as well. I like to do the mix of like fifty percent watching the game and then fifty percent metrics to back up what I'm seeing and see if I'm seeing the right thing. Mm-hmm. But when you just if you just looked at kyle pitts by his metrics you'd be like oh my god this guy should be a top five tight end and that's what we thought he was going to be this year the problem is when you only attempt 13 passes a game it doesn't really matter and for again i i don't know how to explain it because you would say running a georgia tech offense in the nfl is just not going to work but it's working (laughs) for the falcons give them credit cordell patterson came back and is already great for them uh, Kyle Pitts until they make a, I, I don't think they're switching to Desmond Ritter this year and they might give Mariota another chance next year. But I think until a quarterback situation changes, I said this a few weeks ago and people called me crazy because Kyle Pitts had that one game mixed yeah. in there, but Drake London, and Kyle Pitts have been droppable for weeks. I, I don't know how you trust starting either one of them. No, 285 receiving yards only for Kyle Pitts compared to that thousand and twenty six last year. I oh. know. Just, just disgusting. Uh, hey, uh, what about Josh Allen? We had the the UCL, mm-hmm. the elbow news, the he might play through it. Uh, Josh Allen is so good, and you have that leg benefit, Jake. I, I'm I'm leaning towards at least for like this week, saying, okay, how does it look? How does it appear? And then kind of deciding because really, uh, there's always the question when people say, oh, do I drop this guy? Do I bench? So my my follow up is always, well, who are you going to get to replace him? And <laughs> right. uh, you know, a 50 percent Josh Allen is better than most. Right. And that's the biggest thing is most teams who have Josh Allen probably don't even have a backup because they weren't doing anything outside of Josh Allen's bye week because where else are you going to start a quarterback? So unless you're in a thin league and like Justin Fields was still sitting out there, I don't know who else you're going to turn to because I still, as you said, 50% Josh Allen, as good as Mariota's been, he's a QB1 this year. I'm still not playing Mariota over Josh Allen if he's starting. That's what you just, you kind of have to take it. If it looks gross and they continue to have him play through the injury, as you said, then maybe you think about it next week and going forward. But the biggest concern they seem to have is not so much the pain and the throwing motion. And of course, we're listening to all the doctors like inside injuries and the doctors yeah, that yeah. cover for other sites and stuff like that. Is it's not like a pitcher because a pitcher that, you know, 100, 150 times you throw the ball, it's maybe 35, 40 at max. And it's a different motion. You know, it's a different, it's a more natural motion. So if he can pay, play through it, it seems the concern is gripping the ball. And that's where you saw some of the mm-hmm. passes float on him late in that game. 
that's the concern there. So I'm still playing Josh Allen. You still have to play Stefan Diggs. But with how boom or bust Gabriel Davis has been, and then Isaiah McKenzie shows up like every fourth game, I don't know that you play. You don't play anybody except for Stefan Diggs, really. Yeah, yeah. And I'm interested, too, to see how how or if they might finally say, hey, maybe we need to run the ball a little bit more because we know that's a refusal. I, I, I don't necessarily want to gamble on that, but it's something I'm going to be tracking anyway, just to, you know, just to see, right? Maybe. And you can see De- Devin Singletary has been getting a lot of work. They traded for Naeem yeah. Hines, which yeah. makes you... The weird thing about Naeem Hines, though, is that they tried to sign J.D. McKissick, and then Josh Allen's still under, but he's close to the middle of the pack of throwing to running backs, but they still didn't increase this year. Naeem Hines only has one game with him. Does that really move forward? Mm-hmm. Because Devin Singletary wasn't seeing very many pass attempts. Actually, I think he had a couple in one game and then three other games with just one, one target every single game. Right. So... I don't know that it'll be that much. Maybe the elbow will force him to. Uh, but the concern here is then do we really go with Singletary or do we go with Naeem Hines? Because Singletary has basically been discount Derrick Henry for them because he's not used much in the passing game. So yeah. I'd say Naeem Hines if you're feeling frisky. But uh, <laughs> again, it might just be Josh Allen for Stefan Diggs until we see how this plays out. Yeah. If, if we want to get nuts, go with uh, go with Singletary. Let's see let's see what goes down. Jake, tell people where they can find you, all your great work. You're tremendous on social media and all the work with The Athletic. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, at All In Kid, as I tweet out everything, but I'm at The Athletic. If you click on any of the articles, you'll find a discount there. And then All In Football is the podcast I have, which you can find on YouTube and based every streaming platform that's out there. You know that. That's that's right. Yeah, just go everywhere and it's it's there. It's somewhere. Uh, Jake, man, let's do this again sooner than, uh, than last time. Thank you so much, my friend. Of course. All right, there he is, Jake Seeley from The Athletic. Okay, folks, that will do it. You got your fantasy football. You got your betting. You got your Browns-Dolphins. Let's get ready for Sunday. Browns versus Dolphins. As Jake Trotter from ESPN told me on Tuesday's show, he feels if the Browns win, they're going to the playoffs. So let's make it happen. Browns, Dolphins, we'll see you back on Tuesday. See if it's a Victory Tuesday celebration or if we are scratching our heads and trying to figure things out from here. For all the guys, for all the guests, for all of you watching and interacting on social media, as always, go Browns! And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow The Sick Podcast with Andy McNamara on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.